The following conversation is with Jim Ward of Family Loft. Jim is the owner and handler of the Hoosier Classic Million Dollar Race, and he and his wife, Kelly, also own and run Vita King Pigeon Products. Jim came on and gave great advice to those who want to learn what condition, what blueprint you should have to get your young birds ready to send to one lofts. He also goes over his history in pigeons and some of the challenges that he faces as a one loft handler. This is an awesome episode. I really appreciate Jim's time and thank you, Kelly, for getting us set up. I think you're going to enjoy it. If you do, please like, subscribe, and leave us a comment. Thank you. All right, Jim Ward, thank you so much for coming on. The Hoosier Classic, Million Dollar Classic, right? Million Dollar Race, yes, sir. Yeah. Hoosier Million Dollar Race. And so how did you begin in pigeons? How did you get started? Where, how old were you? When did it begin for you? Uh, probably like most of you all. We, I, I was introduced to them at about six or seven years old. My uncles had them. Uh, unfortunately, right at that time, as I was old enough to know what the birds were all about, they were starting their careers and met their wives. And so the birds were gone rather quickly. It wasn't until I was either 10 or 11 years old that my parents allowed me to have them. And luckily, I grew up in a neighborhood that there were still quite a few pigeon flyers. So it wasn't too hard to get into a club and, and all that. We were on the south side of Chicago. And I think from about 85 to 92, 93, I uh, got out of high school. Uh, I had birds every day. And then, you know, just out of high school, was looking to to set my foot somewhere with a career or college. and so the birds went away for a while. Uh, it wasn't until I think 2006 or 2007, I, I got back into the sport. Before you knew it, 2012, we were heavy in. So were you in uh, Chicago when you came back in 2006 or was this in Indiana? How did you- uh, in Indiana. So uh, we when we started our family here, uh, we knew we didn't want to raise a family in Chicago. It was a pretty tough area. Right. So we uh, we navigated to Indiana and uh, bought our home here and uh, raised our children here. And uh, so Wanata, Indiana is where we got the birds back. So when you decided to get back into it, uh, did you do some research on loft construction? Did you do some research on who you wanted to get birds from? How did you kind of decide to go from there? There was so much that, has, that had changed in the time that I was gone from the pigeons. And getting back in, I thought, well, you just put a shed up. You got some birds. I bought birds from every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there. And uh, um, they were okay for the club. But I learned really quick about systems, the light system, the dark system. And this was something we didn't have back in the 80s or or maybe Mike Gannis was coming up with it in the early 90s. Uh, so there was a lot to learn. Uh, yeah, so our first loft was an 8 by 12 shed. That pigeon loft lasted two weeks. It was gone. I gave it to my neighbor. I brought in a 12 by 24. It wasn't, but three months later, an additional loft was added. And we just kept adding from there. And, it, you know, you could be in a loft for three years before you realize, oh, man, why didn't I think of this before? We make changes all the time. Absolutely. And uh, where did you acquire your birds for the new lofts that you built? Early on, uh, we would buy birds. Uh, I think off of iPigeon or some of the local guys in Chicago. And uh, then it started, I wanted to get more serious. And I think it was about 2008, I reached out to uh, Mike Gannis through, through a friend, a mutual friend. And uh, I get a message on my phone back from Mike Gannis. Hi, Jim. Uh, you know, we've got such and such bird. And I think it was like for the pair, it was like $12,000. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I ain't got this. I can't do this. So it took me about three days to work up the courage to call him back and tell him, hey, you know, I that's out of my league. And uh, he was very polite, very kind. And he said, oh, well, we have grandchildren, you know, and you could do this and that. So we bought several uh, grandchildren of uh, back then was a president in uh, Topo and, and those early birds. And they were good for us. They, they worked really good for us in the club. Yeah. Those are really good birds. Uh, one of my uh, best breeders goes back to the topo hen, that, that, that same blood from Mike. 
Very good stuff. Yes. So when you're flying on the club level, did you start out with young birds and then go into old birds? Did you like one or the other more? Always liked young birds. I didn't fly old birds for a while. It, it was several years before we flew old birds. Young birds, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Our first race back, we had one of the oldest electronic clocks at the time. I didn't have it, have it plugged in. And as I see the birds coming in, there's about 20 of them. They all come in the loft, nothing clocked. I'm taking wires apart, plug it back in. I get a beep. I scanned two birds. I was happy. I was in the system. Two birds. Only to find out we win the race with the first two birds that I scanned. Oh, wow. Uh, could, could have had one through 20, right? Right. Well, the following week, we made sure we knew how to run the clock. And uh, we we did take one through 20 that week. So it was the dark system that really helped us with young birds. It made it easy for us to get birds through the mold. And then I think it was about 2012, we started to play with old birds. And uh, if I would have a favorite, now would be old birds. I really like old birds. Uh, you can motivate them. Uh, there's not much training involved. Uh, but in our area, there's far and few between with pigeon flyers. There is a man in the area, Mike Parrish, who's trying to resurrect the uh, sport and get the club back. And he's doing a pretty good job. But we'll see where it goes. So with as busy as you are with the race, are you able to do any club flying if, if it was to come back? We would love to, but realistically speaking, with the race, I don't think we could. Yeah, it'd be pretty it's tough. Too, too busy. Yeah. Thank, thank God we're able to fly one loft races. Yeah, exactly. And you do very well at one loft races. So when did that begin for you that you decided to go from club flying to participating in one loft? Did that happen before the Hoosier, I imagine? It happened before the Hoosier, but we sucked at it. It was terrible. My club pigeons that I was flying with, and I, I did very well in the club. I thought, well, this, this isn't too hard. We'll just ship them off. First race we shipped them to was the Shasta class. And Dean Welsh ran the race. Very good man. Uh, send the birds there. By the 150-mile race, my birds were gone. So, okay. Right away, in my mind, I'm blaming poor Dan Welsh that it's his fault. Right. I send them again next year. My birds are gone by the 150-200. Then I sat back and I realized, what, what am I doing wrong here? You know, there was a difference at that time. And I think there's still a difference today between club pigeons and one loft pigeons. And I just didn't have the right birds. Uh, so it was about 2012, 2013, we started playing with the one loft races. And I think by 2017, I was tired of losing money and, and started to do my homework. So what is the difference in your opinion of the difference between a one loft and a club pigeon is it maturity of the birds is it immune system is it ability to work without much motivation what is it do you think that's the big difference because when you're flying in a club you can motivate your birds you can give them this give them that you can do your own sort of training one lofts they're all under the same roof and they have to be a kind of a special kind of pigeon is that the difference or what do you think you said it right there jeff it's it's a special kind of pigeon it's a pigeon that doesn't need to be motivated it's a pigeon that the immunity is there. You got to have a strong, strong immunity with your family of pigeons for one off racing. And I, uh, I just think they develop differently as far as maturing. You do need fast maturing pigeons. Uh, we're lucky that we can fly races that are early fall, but the races you you see it like at uh, Paul Daniels, race. and he tells everybody send males. A lot of guys don't listen, but send send cocks because they're they're more mature. They're going to develop more more quickly, and they're going to be driving the hens. They're going to drive them off. So uh, you need fast maturing pigeons. You need good pigeons. You know, find a find a fancier that does well in the law of races and watch what they do. You know, watch right. watch their family. You know. So whenever you're deciding what to send to a one loft maybe it's paul's race maybe it's something in california or, or florida or new york what what are you looking for uh what type of pigeon are you looking for is it something you're handling is it more pedigree based what what is your criteria for a good one loft pigeon that you're going to personally send out okay so i look at i look at the races i look who, who flies the races and just by name you almost know the family of pigeons these guys all have now because of facebook everybody promotes what they have so uh, a lot of my blood, 
most of my blood is from Gannis family law. And I look to see who wins there. If, if a guy who has a bunch of Gannis blood is winning there, well, there, there's a good chance my birds can hold up there. Same thing, I watch Mike where he does well. I try to follow. Uh, again, the timing of, uh, of when we wean the youngsters to play the big part. Uh, one thing I noticed is usually after three rounds, your quality diminishes in, in race results with your youngsters. So your fourth and fifth round that I'm sending maybe to Big Andy's race or the Florida Pigeon Derby or Pattaya, they uh, they might have a disadvantage because they're on the fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth round from those parents. So now we're learning to keep a separate set of breeders for those for those races. Okay, uh, if we want to do well in the Crooked River, he gets my first round. You know he train he's training by the Fourth of July. They're down the road. So why are you going to try to send your birds there May 10th? You know, you got 60 days to get your birds up routing and on a trailer. And so send them in as early as possible. California, you got a little more time. Send them a little later. Um, yeah, that's, you got to think about all the variables involved. Yeah, so that's great advice. You have to look at the schedule, look at not only the race schedule, but the training schedule when they do these tosses and try to yeah. determine the best time to send them. That that makes a lot of sense. And are you are you looking other than that criteria, are you looking for anything physical in the, the pigeon? Or is it is it something that you just you're you know relying on your good pairs and just send out whatever they breed or what are you looking for there, if anything? Yeah. So we sent out a, about 35 youngsters last week to one off races. There was about 51 to pick through. Uh, I could have sent all 51. We sent 35, of them. you know, 16 of them didn't make the cut for me. Doesn't mean they're a bad pigeon, but I know it within seconds in my hand, what I like, it doesn't mean it's, it's right or wrong, but if I don't like the pigeon within a 10 seconds of holding it, it's, it's, it's not going to put the money on, you know, right. or it's not going to go in the breeding. There's a, back in the day, I would fill a box with pigeons and ship them. Just go, 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 go. Well, you do that and you're going to lose a lot of money really fast. Right. You're never going to get rich racing pigeons, Jeff. You know that. Right. Uh, but you can try to control your losses. Yeah, absolutely. You know? But uh, yeah, I just look for something that replicates the parents as far as what I think. Uh, you know, I try to think, is this bird going to handle like the mom or dad? What's it favor? If it comes out, maybe the genetics between the two two parents who you think are two super pigeons, they just don't click. So uh, they don't go to races. And, and listen, my criteria doesn't work because if so, it would, you know, we would only need a few pair of pigeons. Right. But, and, and do you think it's, uh, is there a certain body type that you like? Is there a medium, medium to small, medium to large, or you just kind of wait? You pro kinda probably judge? like, probably like most medium, well-balanced type vents, uh, strong back. You know, I, I'm not an eye sign guy. I, I don't say it. There's no such thing as eye sign. Right. I've just never been one to understand it. Right. So they, uh, I believe in it. It's, I just don't understand it, you sure. know, and uh, just like when you're at a pigeon auction, I'm probably as guilty as the rest. A guy will take a bird out of a cage and he'll go through all the motions and pull the wing out, shake the beak, look down the throat, look at the eye. And I bet you 80% of the people don't know what they're looking for. Right, right. So the race, re the race results are going to be what they're going to be. Yeah, yeah. So whenever you're starting to fly these one lofts, you're, you're getting the type of birds that work in one lofts, you're studying and everything. Uh, do you think that selecting these birds that do well at these one lofts and bringing them back and breeding out of these birds that do well at one lofts gives people a better chance of success at other one lofts more so than the club pigeons. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, there's so many good birds left behind at the end of the season in these races. And it, it kills me that guys don't want their birds back. We give a lot of them away. And then you hear stories. Oh, remember the bird I, that you gave our club for an auction? He produced this and this. These are good pigeons. They've been through battle. They've been through the race series, all the training, the losses. Uh, they make good good breeders, yes. I would absolutely breed out of them. I think you develop even a better, stronger immunity with these pigeons as well. 
right because they're introduced to different pigeons from around the country around the world and um, they have to be able to build up that immunity to be able to survive that series just yes. from the get-go um, my best breeding hen right now I call wildfire she's uh, from 2021 she's Lamberton one the first pigeon I ever ringed in 21 I sent her to you all and uh, she ended up having one pretty good race but the rest of the races she was a little bit behind but when I got her back she was just as good in the hand as any pigeon I had in my loft. And I thought, you know, you made it through the series. I want to try you out. Well, she has bred the first Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 2022 Young Birds. She bred the Texas Center uh, Summer Convention winner, one of two birds on the drop in 100 degree heat. She bred the Texas Center Winter Convention winner. That was two times in the first drop I call Louisiana Jane. So the reason I ask you that, and I'm glad to hear that you agree, is that I think even though she wasn't champion bird, she wasn't first drop on the final, she made it through. And I think there's value in that. Absolutely. That she was able to pass that, uh, really that backpack of, of immunity and health that they get over the time of going through that. She passed that on to her youngsters and, and you know, she may not have been champion bird, but she's really breeding well. So I wanted, I've been wanting to tell you that for a while, but. Good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, there's a lot of good birds uh... And you hear you hear the stories of the guys that bring them home and breed them, and they bred the winner the following year, and they didn't do anything in the race the year previously. It happens. I would absolutely breed out of them off pigeons that didn't score. Absolutely, we do. Yeah, because you never know that hen if she would have stayed there and flown as a yearling, maybe she would have been the champion bird. You just don't know what what happens with these birds. Some of them don't get get right just right when they need to. It takes a little bit more time. Yeah. So I think I'm not sure if it was 19 or 20. Or 20 and 21, we offered an old bird series here. And there wasn't a lot of uh, a lot of people behind it, but we would get a couple hundred birds for an old bird series. And you wouldn't believe how these birds developed as uh, as yearlings. And uh, and it, we would fly them out to 500 miles. And uh, the bird, you know, birds that didn't do anything as a young bird. Right. Were, they were developed. A couple of birds. Yeah, beautiful pigeons. Yeah. Beautiful pigeons. Uh, we we rush the pigeons, you know. As, as Americans, we rush rush the pigeons. Uh, ain't nothing wrong with that, but yeah, if, I think we're we're all a little impatient. Yeah, that's the one loft. The one loft game is just different. It takes a different kind of pigeon, as we discussed. So I, but I I think it's interesting that uh, just because a pigeon's not able to do it as a young bird doesn't mean it's not going to be able to come back and pass that on, you know, good genetics and uh, good immunities on to the youngsters. So uh, right. at what point did you decide that you wanted to do your own one loft? Because you have to have a, a lot of characteristics. You have to be able to handle business. You have to be able to handle a mass amount of pigeons and their health and all the challenges that come with with that and the biggest challenge you have to handle all the fanciers that want to join the race and have their own opinions on how you should do things how did you decide to get into this crazy game and, and start the hoosier uh again i was with a handful of pigeon fanciers we were on a, a trip to uh, belgium and holland we went with mike a uh, gentleman by the name of al hilliard was my partner in some of the pigeons at the time and i don't know it was over dinner i had a nice piece of property here it was discussed that we would like to try it. I don't think until that conversation that night, I ever gave it any thought until that evening in, in March of 2012, I think. And it, and it just happened. The race went from 290, 300 pigeons to 500 pigeons, to 800 pigeons, 1,700 pigeons. I was looking at uh, the archives today, how all the races have doubled in pigeons in the last five years. So that was that was the initial part of it. And about, I think it was 2016, I bought my partner out. He lived a, he lived about 40 miles away and he couldn't get here every day. He was a very good man, good friend of mine. So it was decided that I would buy him out. And then uh, that was it. As far as the million dollar race, <clears throat> uh, you could thank Adu and Mike Gannis for that. We were all in Vegas for the gala. I think it was in 16, late, yeah, 16. And uh, they're the reason why I have gray hair now. <laughs> race. So they, they came to me and 
we had just come off a decent season with the Hoosier and 17 was even better. And it just, it just steamrolls from there. You know, it's, it's scary every year to make sure you're going to get the birds. And, and we put a big guarantee up and we'll see what happens, but it's, it's been, uh, we've had our roller coasters over the year, a roller coaster ride over the years. Right. But that's how it all came about. So what year did it begin as far as your first, the one loft you hosted, did you say? I think it was 2013. 13, I okay. Think, I think we're in our 11th season now, 11th or 12th season now. Great. Yeah, I think we're entering our fall. So what are the big challenges that people may not know about hosting a one loft race, especially the size of the Hoosier with the amount of, you know, fanciers that enter? the amount of pigeons that are there the and you know then having to you know you all have a great event there every year so what are some of the big challenges that you have you and you and kelly have dealing with that and i and i think every race will have the challenges uh for us it's uh and every race will have the same challenge regulating the health so you have birds that come in in mid-february you have birds that come in in may and a lot of guys don't want me to say this or don't want to hear it, but young bird sickness is in every every one loft race. I don't care who you are. If you come out and say, no, we never had it, well, you're full full of it. Okay. Right, right. It's there. As soon as we mix our birds together, it's there. So you're going to deal with that all the way through until you're done taking pigeons. Okay. You got to stay ahead of it. what it is is circle virus. That's not what's going to kill you. It's going to be the secondary infections. So you 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 have to be in front of those secondary infections before they come. Uh, canker, paratyphoid, uh, respiratory issues, PMV. That's the biggest problem. Second problem is we are just like a Crooked River, Blue Bucket, as far as when we have to start racing. We're, we're, we have to start training or getting the birds moving by July. Some of these birds that come in end of April, early May, they're going to still be going through a bolt. Right. And you're training. It's a big, right. it's a big issue. They will finish by the end of the season. But that's that's a lot of stress on a young bird to be trained and, and uh, managed still going through a molt. About right. 90% of them will be done with it uh, before you get them on the trailer. But you're going to have that, that percentage that uh, struggles. Uh, as far as the people, there's more good in the sport than bad. Uh, uh, we have no problem with the people. We, we've, we've met some of our best friends through this sport and uh, our clients. And, you know, if we make a mistake, we may hear about it. And uh, we just talk it through, you know. Uh, we stay away from the negativity because it, it's not going to take you anywhere. Right. But the health, the health is the biggest issue. And trying to get, if, you could only, if we could only educate the new guys about it because everybody wants to fly a one loft race now and we're, we're happy that you do but you should know some things before you ship birds to a one loft race so let's get into that Look, what is the blueprint for these guys that may not know exactly what to do what if you could have a blueprint of the perfect young bird coming in as far as what was done previous to getting to you what would that look like for guys that are wanting to learn and know that the start of the blueprint would be in your breeding law and your breeding loft is where all the magic happens. I don't care what bloodline you have. I don't care where you get your birds from. There's good birds everywhere. It starts, if you're going to pair your birds up in December, January, it starts in October or maybe sooner. Get your get your breeders on a good schedule. Keep, keep your loft on regularity. When I mean, there's guys that I hear, they feed their birds someday at 2 in the afternoon, some days at 10 p.m., Saturdays, they missed the feeding because they were just too busy. You can't, your birds are not going to be healthy like that. You know, regularity brings on content. Regularity brings on form. Regularity brings on health. So keep, get your get your affairs in order in your breeding loft. I, I'm a strong believer in vaccinations. I vaccinate my breeders every year, two months before breeding. We treat for canker, paratyphoid, uh, uh, PMB, erota. Uh, we'll send the droppings off for uh, worms or coxie. We never have it. The lofts are clean daily. If if it does pop up, they're treated for it. 
then that's it. That, that, I mean, you don't have to do anything else, but you have to get them a good start. If you get your breeders a good start, your youngsters are going to come out looking like diamonds. So here at our loft, we vaccinate around 21 days old while the birds are still with the parents for PMV rota. When we wean them, we'll treat them with a canker tablet from uh, Dr. Peters. They'll get a canker tablet. A week later, they'll get another vaccination. We vaccinate twice. You don't have to, again, I'm just a vaccination guy. Right. Before we ship them to any race, especially uh, races uh, abroad, such as Pattaya or Vic Ball, Victoria Falls, we, we'll vaccinate them twice for sure. And, and, and get a little age on your babies. You don't need to send them when they're screaming, when they're squeaking and screaming. Uh, make sure you spend some time with your babies. Make sure you know they all know how to drink out of a drinker. You, Jeff, you wouldn't believe how many birds. We use two different types of drinkers here because there's birds that come in in every shipment that never drink out of a drinker. Yeah. People pluck them out of the nest and put them in a box. My birds spend about three weeks to four weeks in a their own separate loft room where they have to they have to fight for food and, and, and learn how to drink before they go to a one loft race. And I promise you, if you spend time with them and you put your time in with them, you're you're going to get much better results out of them. Um, so I, back to vaccinations, treat for, treat them once for canker before you ship them out. And then it's up to the one loft manager to take it from there. Don't overcrowd your boxes. Uh, that's a common sense thing, right? Uh, I'll tell you this. When I open up a box of work birds and I pull that baby out and there's no bedding in there and he's got green you know what hanging from him for being stressed out and yellow down feathers all over him you lose you lost you just donated to the race right i promise you you lost and it happens over and over you see it and you look at the name sure enough it's a name you don't recognize he's a new guy somebody didn't teach him or he didn't listen and if you're not learning okay you don't have to talk to jim ward to learn but go to YouTube. Jeff Lamberton has all these videos. Uh, Frank McLaughlin has all these videos. Study, learn. It's You might as well just go buy a lottery ticket if you're going to do that to your pigeons because I promise you, you're, you're behind the eight ball. You're not going to get it. I saw uh, Rick Mee posted a photo, I think it was yesterday or the day before. He opened a box and there were six birds in a three or three or something and one and a half of the box, they overheated and died and they're just overcrowded. So I think people are trying to save money. And if you do it that way, you're donating, as you said, to the race. You're, you're you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I applaud Rick for posting it because uh, smart people listen and the ones who don't care are going one ear the other. Yeah. It's not going to stop it. People are going to continue to do it. But again, they, they lost. And I promise you, the, those yeah. birds that survived in that box, I wish you'd give out the band number. Rick, if you're watching, keep track of them band numbers. They're not going to score any race. They're stressed out so bad already. They're done. Yeah, that is interesting to look at that and to see how they end up doing. And uh, like you said, you guys are willing to come on here and talk or post stuff on social media, educating people. But uh, it's up to the people to, you know, decide if they're going to listen and apply this or not. So um, getting them vaccinated. Yeah, go ahead. There's so many avenues to learn. There's so many good pigeon people out there that will, will talk you through a situation. There's no reason that a guy's not learning. I mean, right. social, like you said, social media, or pick up a phone, call Vita King or Foy's, or talk to somebody. Talk to one of the pigeon warehouses if you have a question. Right. But it's not rocket science. It's you putting in the time with your pigeons. That's what it takes. So, um, as far as the health goes, uh, we want to see, excuse me, we want to see them if, you know, this is, I do the same thing as you, vaccines, you want to make sure their age is right, you want to make sure that the boxes aren't overcrowded and the birds are eating and drinking on their own. Is there anything else I haven't covered with as far as what you like to see when you're opening the box? Clean, clean pigeons, <laughs> clean pigeons that look like you uh, took good care of them at home. It goes back to that. Yeah. I mean, we could uh, we could dress up a dress up a donkey to look like a show pony, but we, he's not going to win the race. Right, right, right. It happen. And uh, 
Another another thing is for a beginner is uh, you don't have to go out and buy ten thousand dollar pigeons. There's good pigeons all over. Just do your homework and, and look at the guys who are winning and contact those guys. Go down the list until you find somebody you think you're compatible with to get along and buy some pigeons from. Or maybe he'll give you some pigeons. I don't know. But um, I think you're running the mill club pigeons out there. A lot of them can't can't handle the stress of a woman. Right. There's, now, there's exception to that. Don't get me wrong. I know people are going to say, oh, I could do both. I'm sure you can sure you can but um i think it's a special pigeon at the end of the day that wins a, that wins a one-off race because they go through a lot absolutely so um how did you guys get started with vita king that's another crazy story <laughs> uh I was, I was getting ready to pull out of my driveway one day and i get a text message are you uh are you still ready to buy vita king I look at it and it's uh, Mike Gannis's phone number. So I text him back. I said, you're texting the wrong guy. Sends me a message back. Something along the lines, oh, I thought this was Jim Ward. <laughs> you know, just being a smart ass. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know where that kind of came out of left field. Maybe it was mentioned several years earlier. I think it was the time uh, he and Debbie were looking to sell and uh, for two weeks we went back and forth. We didn't know that it, we can pull it off and we were afraid to lose customers that we you know Mike and Debbie are great people I tell you what they got they, the two of them have a work ethic that not many can rival I mean they sure. it's hard, hard to keep up with right so uh they uh they held our hand for a few weeks and walked us through it my wife we owned a restaurant at the time uh we were looking to get out of the restaurant business and it just perfect timing you know perfect timing for us and it was available through Mike and Debbie, and I think we're six years later now. So here we are. Yeah, you it was a good decision. Job. Yeah, you do a great job there, and you have a lot of great products that you bring in. And and uh, so I wanted to hear that story because I knew Mike and Debbie had it previously. So yeah, you know they had it for they had it for thirty two years, and everything we sell, they they either developed it or they found it and brought it in. Uh, there's not too much that we've added or changed. Um, yeah, we were just two very lucky people to be able to get it what we did. That's yeah. for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you about the race. Some, you know, somebody watching, maybe they're new, maybe they don't know a ton about the Hoosier race. What distances are you, are your races and, and, you know, tell us about the race itself. So well, this year we're going to have a sprint series added. Uh, I believe it's 75 miles uh, will start the, the sprint series. Our final race will end up between 350 and 375 miles. We we advertised 350, but depending on the weather, we'll go a little further. The last, not this past year, but the two years before, the Verge went 372 miles. That's the furthest distance I believe we've gone. Uh, there'll be a 75, a 100, a 125, a one, uh, 165, 220, and then the final. So with the added on uh, sprint races, I think there's seven races total. But the main uh, East Pigeon Award will start at the 125 and on. So will there be a sprint East Pigeon? Award, yes. Okay. And, and, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that that seems to be uh, exciting for people. There's a lot of guys that have the sprint type of birds that they can send for that category, so that'll be exciting to add that. And uh, what direction are you flying out of? Ah, million dollar question, Jeff. <laughs> we fly from so uh, south to north. However, we had about ninety birds left over that I kept from the Hoosier, and I broke them up into two teams. Okay. So we have about 45 to 50 birds per team. I'm training right now in two different directions. One is east, southeast, and the other one is straight west. I cannot give you anything good. I can't tell you anything good about it just yet, just that the birds are coming home. <laughs> uh, it's a different, uh, different uh, direction, so they struggle a little bit. Once the weather uh, gets a little better in our area, we'll pound them every day 
And we, we want to see what our returns look like from 100, 150 miles with these two teams in different directions. And uh, we anticipate on changing the direction. Uh, south of us, about 60 miles is very big wind windmill farm. Yeah, the birds yeah. don't the birds don't get hit by these windmills. They they're, they're not even close to the windmills. However, I think there's something there that uh, throws the birds off. Sure, we, we we tend to start seeing our problems once we get 60 miles in training, and uh, we're looking to make changes on that. Is that uh, you're going to stay south this year and then change next year? Do you think, or is that something you're going to change for this year? No, so I I would like to change this year once we could get the those two teams of old birds dialed in with some good weather and get them out and we'll make our final decision. Yeah. I think that's really interesting to continue to test things and, uh, you know, continue to develop. And I think that's great that you're willing to, uh, test things out and try new things. And, and, uh, that'll be exciting to see, uh, how that works out and what you find from that data. Yeah. Yeah. We have to do something. Yeah. Um, future of one loss is something I'm curious about. Do you think it's going to continue to adapt to where it will be um, more than it is now? Or do you think it's kind of set in its ways now? Do you see anything in, in the future that you think is going to change with one loss since it is becoming more and more in the United States, what people do? Because as you know, clubs are getting smaller. People are so spread out over the United States. Um, is there something along the lines there that you you see in the future changing with one loss or maybe adding to it? I think the sky's the limit. I think your your purses, your prizes are going to just keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, for now, uh, it's, uh, I'll give you an example. You brought up Vita King. When we bought Vita King, we sold seventy five hundred Vita King bands a year. This year, they sold fifteen thousand bands in about forty five days. Wow! So it, it's double. And that's not who knows what Jeds and Foys are selling in, in the AU. So the birds are out there. I mean, the people are breeding pigeons like crazy. I think uh, I think the sport's going to keep going, growing through through one-off races. Um, I think I counted seventy-two or seventy-five one-off races on Wind Companion the other day. So there's a big variety that you can choose from, uh, small races to big races. But I think. Uh, I think now and in the future, people gravitate towards the big prizes. Right. And there's several off races paying huge dividends if you could you could hit it. Do you think new guys should start with some of the smaller races with less birds before they jump into a Hoosier or a Florida Derby? Do you think it's good to kind of test things out first, or do you think people should jump right into a Hoosier or you know a big race like that? Ideally, in a perfect world, I wish everybody could fly club races first. Right. Know, know what to expect and know how to take care of pigeons. That's a great yes. point. Yeah, ab absolutely. If you can't fly in a club, study the races. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I would. I would suggest that fly some smaller races. You can dabble in the big in the big races. You may hit it. You never know. Yeah, I would. I would definitely uh, pick a pick a smaller race, maybe a not so expensive race to try out. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, when you lose at a one-off race and you lose money, it's like uh, it leaves a sting, right? And, it uh, does, yeah. Especially for a new guy who's never done it before. It doesn't. When we enter a race, we have uh, a lot of hope of winning, just like anybody else. But realistically, we know on the final day anything could happen. Right. These new guys, uh, God bless them, they, they think they're going to come in with guns blazing and take over. Yeah, right. And then when they lose all their birds on a semifinal, well, they they uh, they want to throw in the towel. So, yeah, yeah, start small, go slow, study the races, don't play beyond your means. It, it can consume you, it can take you, you know. Um, there's high rollers and there's, there's people who uh, – have only a certain amount set aside to play in. And, and if you're one of those guys, there's no problem. Just be conservative with it, you know? Yeah. And I think the reason I ask is your race, especially with the Hoosier, you're, you're going up against the best of the best, the big boys, the guys that have been doing it since the start, the guys that have 
access to some of the best one loft pigeons in the world. And so the year race is one of those that's it's it's the top the toughest of the tough competition. And uh, you can see that with the results every year for sure. Um, what is it like for you if you're going to load the birds up for training or maybe let's just say load a bird up for the 75 mile sprint race as far as getting that many pigeons scanned and making sure everyone's in the crate, you know, in the trailer? What's that process like? Is it I'm sure right by now you're a seasoned veteran that you can handle it, but I'm sure early on it's a little bit crazy at times. The first thing we, we, we've we learned to do now is turn your phone off. Turn our phones off while we're doing this because you're going to have several guys saying, are you basketing tonight? What's going on? And, and you, you feel the need to respond, right? You have to respond. So I turn the phone off when we do our thing. Uh, it's it's always stressful. You know, it's uh, we do have a new trailer being built. But, I mean, for basketing, it'll be different. You have to hand scan every bird for every every race. Uh, it takes about four hours here to hand scan everything in. If you're just training, we have a new trailer being built where, where the birds will self-load. And uh, I want to thank Florida Pigeon Derby and Tony Cuevas for helping us with their designs of their trailer. They, they were very, very helpful. Uh, so we should take hold of that trailer by the end of May and should make our lives and the pigeons' lives a lot less stressful. But, yeah, it, it's it's, it's uh, kind of you have to psych yourself up for it for yeah. that day and know you're going to be tied down and, and try to get it done because I drive every race except the final. I'm, uh, yeah, I might have a co-pilot co with me, but uh, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. And then uh, you may post a basketing list and all of a sudden a pigeon's missing. Well, where was it? It was there yesterday on the loft. Well, let us look, you know, and then you have to explain what happened to a pigeon or, or find it in the basketing list that maybe it was there the whole time. Yeah. We've, we've learned to uh, not be so stressed, but it's stressful. Yeah. Especially on the race, on shipping the races, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to be a bit of a weatherman to know, you know, training and everything. It's, there's a lot to it. Yes. Uh, let's uh, move into the family loft because you guys have had great success in one lofts. I was down at the Flying D and saw you had a bird up there really high and uh, you've had a lot of success all over. Um, what are some of your proudest accomplishments that you've had? Uh, the one that I'll never forget, uh, this is a little corny, but uh, probably it was 1989. We didn't win the race. Uh, my pigeon was fifth. So you know what that meant for me? I finally won a club diploma. So I I, I think I might have almost walked all the way home that day. Or, or you know, again, my head was in the clouds, and that and it was a red checker. And I'm not a red checker guy, but um, I get home. I probably handled that bird ten times a day for the next week. You know. <laughs> uh, that that for me went in the first something that was noticeable for me in a club. But yeah, of course, winning the, we've been lucky at Crooked River. We've scored first, second, and third ace pigeons there over the years. Uh, we've won first twice now at, or, or first, first all alone at Paul Daniels and then equal first this past year. We've won the Southern Bell first in the clock and we've won it, I think we won Southern Bell two or three times. We, we've been lucky. Evolution, uh, that was a funny one there. Evolution, we scored first, second, and third on the final. Wow. And uh, uh, I was at a wake. My mom's cousin had passed away. So I'm at a wake with my mom, and I could feel, feel my phone buzzing. Mm -hmm. I looked at my watch, and I'm like, shit, it's, it's about time the birds are due home. So if your phone's buzzing on race day, good chance you're getting a congratulations. Yeah. So I look at my phone, and it's nobody's telling me first, second, or third, but they're just keep saying, look at, look at the clock, you know, look at when could be. My mom looks over at me. She says, what the hell are you smiling about? Because we're at a wake. I said, I got to go, mom. I got to go. <laughs> I think it was John Dragopoulos. I took his call first and he says, man, you ain't going to believe it. Look at the clock. So no, that, that was fun. Uh, a great, great win for us was flying deep all Daniels because about a week before the race, I told my wife, I said, book, book tickets were gone. She said, oh, we're not going. I said, I got a feeling about this bird. Well, I had a feeling about the wrong bird. Midnight oh. Cowboy won the race. 
but it was his brother, his full brother was in the race, 134. He never showed up on the final, but uh, Midnight did. And it was it was a good win. He came all by himself. Yeah, that I saw that picture. I think uh I think Kelly was holding the bird or something, maybe with uh Kimberly or something. But uh tell us about that as far as that was a and every you know, every right? every story has a story, right? So the year before, I wanted to buy something off of Thomas Six for Mike. And uh, Mike comes over. It was the middle of summer. He brings over two or three children of Thomas Six. And he's same line every time. You could pick one or you could pick three. Well, he knows I'm going to probably pick three, right? The one I leave in the basket is the full brother to Thomas Six. I said, no, Mike, that, that one's not for me. I, I'm going to pass on. He says, no problem, I'll take him home. He goes, but in my opinion, that's the best bird in the basket. All right, Mac, I'll buy him. <laughs> we bought him. And, uh, you know, first year he paid for him, himself, and, and the whole basket of birds. Absolutely. So that, that was a good good bird. Yeah, that had to have been a pretty crazy feeling to see one bird come in and then find out it's yours. It, that would probably give me a heart attack. Yeah, you know, we were there at, at Paul's race. There's quite a few one-off managers that show up for the race. I think that year there might have been seven, eight, nine of us there. So we were all in good company to win, to win the race. And, and my wife had stepped away to go to the car to make a phone call. And she didn't know we won. She come walking up. And <laughs> she, she didn't know. It was, it was a good good feeling. Yeah, I uh, the past couple first drops we've been in, uh, I'm always off. For a second, my wife, when I come back, my wife's like, why'd you walk away every time you walk away? So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Kelly walking off to do a phone call is the key, you know, who knows? Yeah. 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 And just like this year, we, we, we weren't watching right away. Uh, we were meeting the, somebody for a birthday party dinner and I just so happened to turn the phone on at the last, last second, seen our name. So it, it was fun. And what, what this race is, uh, what was really good about this race was it was a son of midnight cowboy to win. So it's nice to see his offspring starting again. For the flying D first drop? Yes, first drop. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Well, congrats on that and all your success with that. And uh, you all put on, for those watching that may be curious about attending in person for the Hoosier, you all put on an awesome event. You have um, a big building that's dedicated to hosting everybody. You have a, a bar there. You have TVs that show the live results. You have tables for the buffet that you all put together. Jan and I got to go in 22, 2022. We got to meet you and Kelly there and meet a bunch of people that uh, I've made friends with while I was there. Uh, talk to us about the event. And, uh, you know, I think it's awesome. And, and people that are considering going should definitely go partake. It's my favorite day of the year. You know, uh, we get everybody together. Uh, there's still a lot of excitement in the air because the race didn't happen yet. You know, everybody's a champion that evening uh, as, as we do basketing that day. And uh, the weekend starts out with uh, usually an auction at Gannis Family Wolf's hunting lodge there. That would be on a Saturday. Uh, Sunday is basketing. Everybody's allowed to come to the loft, walk through the loft. Um, we put on a, a full dinner for everybody. I, I hope nobody ever leaves here hungry. And then the day of the race, we uh, put on a bit, another big spread, you know, an open bar for everybody. Um, it's it's not our party, it's your party. You, right. you, this party is, is your party, you know. So uh, when you come there, you, sh you should be able to have whatever you want, you know. So it's open bar, all you could eat. And uh, we hope, we just hope everybody has a good time. What the cherry on top is if you could score one early, right? Exactly. Yeah. See. Yeah, meeting meeting the people I got to meet there, uh, from the Greek to McLaughlin to you and Kelly to Gannis, you know, I I you know to see Gannis and and Debbie, and so it was just an incredible experience. We're gonna have to make our way back there uh, soon, but uh, I definitely recommend people that are considering going to to go check it out. And if I recall right, uh, Gannis auction, we got to attend that too. That was a lot of fun. I think you bought uh, a Thomas Six child or something at that auction back then maybe i'm wrong but i feel like you were in the mix no. no so that year that year i bought a daughter of uh i remember this the daughter of wolverine and the victoria head okay i think tim lucas bought the victoria head 
that day and I bought a daughter. And uh, she she was a little bit pricey. I remember my son saying, you're dead. You're dead. Mom's going to kill you. you know? yeah. Let's take her home that breeding season. We pair her up with a grandson of Wolverine. And she produces equal first, equal first, first ace pigeon at Crooked River. Wow. Uh, we, we've been lucky a few times, you know. Yeah, that's a great and, investment. And there's, there's several good stories. I think it was Becky Perez. Uh, Perez Family Law, they told us that the year before, or maybe the same year, I, I forget, they bought a Thomas Six child, and then they won Crooked River with it the following year. So there's been some good birds bought at his auction, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And again, to see everybody, and boy, the John, the Greek's food that day, I, I still remember how good that was. He's an incredible cook. Yeah, I try to tell him, don't cook all the pork chops, John. Bring some over to my place tomorrow. I know it. I was no, blown away by that. Yeah, he's uh, about one of the happiest guys around too, isn't he? He's yeah, he's awesome. just yeah, sure. he's, he's magnetic, and uh, I'm was really happy for him last year to see his bird get in there, and I got to see Carter down at the Flying D, and he was still buzzing off of that, and so uh, mm -hmm. excited for both those guys, especially John, because he's just a uh, as good as they, you know, as good as it comes. So sure is, sure is. Well. Uh, is there anything that I haven't covered or haven't gone over you want to add that I missed? Just have fun. Don't let the birds take every, take all your time. But if you want to be successful, you do have to give them some of your time. You know. Yeah. Uh, take it slow. Uh, if you think you're going to get rich racing pigeons, and I promise you, it's not going to happen. Not yeah. racing. Not going to do it. But the main thing is have fun. Surround yourself with good people. Uh, Stay away from the negativity. If you ask uh, an individual for some advice and they dance around the uh, the uh, question, leave that person alone because either they don't know the answer or they're not gonna not gonna help you out. You know? Yeah. Uh, again, it, it, I think what you do, and thank you for having me on here. Uh, we're, we're honored that you asked us to be on. Um, all day long we're with the pigeons, and when I come in, I kick back and I'm going through YouTube. I'm watching your videos. You know, well, I appreciate uh, that. We we enjoy them. Uh, Frank McLaughlin, one of the smartest pigeon guys out there. I watch, you know, these guys should watch his videos as well. And, and what what both of these are doing is really really good. We enjoy it. Well, I appreciate it, and I'm sure that none of this could be possible for you without Kelly, right? She's the the boss behind the scenes there. Oh, uh, she's. Uh, She's my, uh, she's my best, you know, she's my best friend. Uh, anything I have in life is because of her. She's my motivator. She keeps me going. And, uh, I love her. I couldn't do anything without her. That's for sure. Well, I wish you all nothing but the best and great luck on the upcoming one loft season. I know how busy you are getting birds in and getting them ready and everything. So I appreciate you taking the time. You certainly didn't have to. And um, I appreciate you and Kelly's uh, time and having Kelly set this up for us and, I really appreciate it, and uh, I'd love to have you back on maybe post-season, and we'll go over how it all went and the future and maybe talk about the new direction you choose, and good luck with that experiment. Sounds well. good, and enjoy your enjoy, enjoy your uh, training days with your dad this week with the birds. Yeah. Don't let those yeah. minutes go by, man. You got something special there. Well, I appreciate it. I really all appreciate right. it. So. All right, well, thank you, and thank you, Jim. Thank you, Kelly, and before I let you go, what's the website people can find the race? hcrace.com uh, hcrace.com okay we're accepting birds now through uh may 10th we have about a little over 1100 here uh we have about 4000 signed up uh, it'll be eventful it'll be good it'll be fun and you on facebook out. yeah yeah who's your classic has a facebook page okay so yeah. people can find it on there and you have a guaranteed payout you're saying Guaranteed payout of one point two million. We've been doing that now for five years, five or six years. And uh, come fly against the best, like you said. Some of the best fanciers in the world are are in this race, and there's a lot of great races out there. Uh, find a race that you have fun with, and and join some one lump races. You'll have fun. All right, Jim and Kelly Ward. Thank you so much again. I appreciate it, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you for having us. All right, Thanks. we'll talk to you later.